It's a 40 minutes. Okay. I thought I have. Um, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, I, you know, I'm going to just brush through certain things. So. From Umesh Misha. Oh, I see, I see. You graduated recently, uh, Yeah. I remember, maybe I s saw your face at one yeah, point. Yeah, I've seen you around, but I've never had a chance to... I see, I see, I see. And you are here... Uh, I have been here for almost 23 years now, but I was... Um, so I graduated from NT Tech. Oh, I see, I see. Together. Oh, remember on the phone every day. Yeah. yeah do you remember yeah. I mentioned to you about uh, my buddy who's doing you know, computing architecture together? Okay. Are you hosting him? Oh, no. Linda is hosting. And I met with him. Yeah, I was going to actually try to see if I. I, I almost called you. And you want to spend some time at 2? Because then um, I'm going to be done at 2. And so we're going to come back to Kemper Hall. To, so you are go, you're gonna meet us in the camp at the uh, faculty lounge. Okay. And you I know how to get in there? You know how to get I the faculty I lounge? I'll give you. I have a link. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now it works with delay. Um, again, I wanted to thank you for being here today. Um, we have a um, very interesting presentation by uh, Dr. Dmitry Strukov. He's a faculty member at um, UC Santa Barbara. And uh, he will talk to us about uh, merging memories for uh, neurocomputing. So Dmitry, um, as I said, he went to Santa Barbara as a faculty member after he worked as a postdoctoral fellow for uh, HP. And he worked with um, Stanley Williams uh, on memory stores. This is a type of a device that they were doing work there and then Dimitri went to UC Santa Barbara, and now he's going to talk to us about some other devices he's also working on. He graduated with his master's in applied physics and mathematics from the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, and then he got his PhD in electrical engineering from Stony Brook University in New York. Um, he's a member of many uh, professional um, societies, and uh, he has done wonderful work, so we are very pleased to have him here with us today. Thank you, Dimitri. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I think, let me see. 
Okay, so uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. And um, so I'll talk about uh, research, which I was involved for probably almost 10 years already. Uh, so now I would like to acknowledge help from all the students, postdocs, and my collaborators, and also find funding agencies. So I'll have three parts in my talk, and the first part will be mostly on motivation. And uh, yes, I will be talking about deep learning. So it is, it is so irresistible today. But it's actually, uh, you know, it's going to lead uh, to what I do, actually, what kind of hardware I develop. So I'm going to spend some of the time on that. And then second part will be on memristors. Third part will be on uh, floating gate devices. All right, so I don't have to spend too much time here. We are in the middle of this artificial intelligence revolution. It is used in many applications. Now the number is growing. And it's all started with this work. It is a, a work by University of Toronto group. Uh, and uh, that, that uh, deep learning uh, convolutional neural network called AlexNet today. So this is a classifier. It can classify images. You can feed an image you know, on this side, and it will tell you what class it belongs to, that it's a flower. Uh, so there are nine layers of neurons. Um, and uh, ev so there are kind of two parts, one convolutional, where every neuron is connected just to a small uh, uh, set of neurons in the preceding layer, called the visual field. And this is biologically motivated. And every neuron is, in general, connected with the same way set of weights, if I just look at the neurons in the same layer. And there is a back-end part where its neurons are fully connected. So uh, in particular, the most uh, important operation in that network is this dot product. So neuron will take an input as uh, the output from the preceding layer neurons, uh, which are scaled by this synaptic weight, W, which is an analog value in general. And the calculate x, so this is a dot product, then it will apply certain uh, thresholding function like a touch before feeding it to the next layer. So this is the most common, most important operation. So now uh, whole, uh, the whole functionality of the network is, is in the weights, in these w's. So how do we find them? So I'm going to talk about just specific kind of neural networks where we uh, train them in a supervised kind of fashion. So we find this Ws in a training stage. So it's a first step preceding the, that kind of uh, classification stage. So in that, st in that step, we start with a kind of a random weights. And we have a set of uh, patterns for which we know the correct label, correct class. So then we will feed patterns one by one. We would record the actual output. Then we, were, we know what the desired output is. And using some kind of optimization algorithm, like a back propagation, we can adjust weight, and we keep doing it until we converge. And uh, after that, the network can do very beautiful things. It can generalize. It can start classifying images it never saw before, just like a human. Uh, so images not from the training set. So what's important, what I want to kind of highlight here, after we calculate the weights, uh, we, I mean, the, 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 the second stage is so-called inference stage. We don't modify the weights. So we just perform classification over and over again. This is true for many applications, uh, like, for example, uh, autonomous cars. They don't really change the weights on the fly uh, or speech recognition. So the weights are frozen. Again, I just want to highlight it that this is going to be important for what I will talk about. Uh, so now, uh, so if I look at the history, there is a long history kind of behind that network. And actually, all of the features of this, uh, of this AlexNet were already, you can argue, appeared you know, almost 30 years ago in LeCun's ConvNet. So why it became so popular now? Well, uh, th this is kind of explains a bit the reason. So when AlexNet came, came out, uh, when they applied to very well-known kind of uh, benchmark for classification called ImageNet, so what you see here is a uh, percentage of patterns misclassified from certain test benchmark. Uh, so it allowed to drop or to increase performance or drop error classification error by almost 10%, which is unheard of for this field. Even like fraction of a percent will get you to the best conference. And uh, this is as compared to some traditional computer vision approaches like SVMs, et cetera. And uh, same happened with speech. 
when deep learning, when this kind of network was applied to speech problems, it, there was a sharp increase in performance. Moreover, as you can see, with a kind of uh, further kind of progress in deep learning, both of the you know speech and in image, we now they, these networks now beat humans, which is kind of really amazing. So the true reason why uh, uh, the breakthrough kind of happened is not due to any advances in algorithm, but due to two factors, and uh, which typically kind of highlighted is first is the availability of large amount of training data. First thing and second, availability of very powerful computers, which allows you to build very large networks, many layers, a lot of neurons. And having both of them kind of on this cartoon, you can see that the performance of this, uh, on this approach is just um, improving. So accuracy is just a functional performance, whereas it's not the same for traditional algorithm. So now uh, uh, the deep learning field is very quickly evolving. So this is your AlexNet. So on on this figure, what you see on the x-axis, you see the number of operations you need to do per inference. So when you just feed one image, how many operations you need to do to get the result out. On the y-axis is an accuracy. So you want to be in the top left corner. The size of the, of, the, of, the, of the circle shows the complexity of the network, number of weights, number of parameters to be more specific. So you can see that. Just in a couple of years, from AlexNet, we went to GoogleNet, which is 10 times less complexity, but actually beating by 15% by, by, by itself AlexNet. So uh, I mean, the main point here is that we still, for every, every inference, we still have to do huge amount of operations. The second point I want to make here is that uh, uh, it's very challenging to be a hardware designer for these deep nets, seeing that picture. So um, uh, the field is evolving very quickly. If I want to create something very optimized for AlexNet, I'm sure it won't be actually as efficient for GoogleNet, or at least, uh, you know, uh, the point, the actual point I want to make is that, for example, you may have heard that, you know, some people starting to claim you don't need uh, analog synapses. We can believe this binary synapses, or there's pruning techniques which works very well. Pruning is just, uh, you know, removing a lot of synapses. Uh, weights saying that uh, you know you don't have to have them there. Uh, the, the network will work very well without them. Well, if I use a very uh, highly optimized network, and the Google Net is a good example. Uh, I mean, the latest data showing that, for example, uh, you know synapses still have to be quite. You still have to have quite a good amount of precision, five bit or so, and the pruning doesn't really work very well. But uh, still. The vector by matrix multiplier is one common kind of ground for all of these networks. OK, so now uh, microprocessors doesn't really, uh, conventional microprocessors not really well suited for this kind of processing. You have GPUs, we have uh, ASICs, we have uh, TPU from Google, which is kind of some, something in between. The records come from academia, of course. And uh, here you see, uh, let's just focus on these two chips. So these chips are ASICs, essentially, with a little bit of flexibility, which only uh, designed to do convolutional part of AlexNet. That's where the 95% or so computation is. So when this ARIES from MIT came out, they claimed they could beat the best GPU at that time in energy efficiency by a factor of 10. The latest chip from uh, Belgium, Leuven University Envision, is claiming they can beat Aris in turn by factor of 10. And uh, you can see the reason uh, it's a better technology. They also kind of used all kinds of tricks uh, in digital circuit design, uh, dynamic voltage scaling, and et so on. Uh, and they use lower precision. So, so now this is as compared to, so GPUs also improved. I'm not sure what kind of uh, factor right now. But uh, the point is that if I compare with biology, and that's, these are very crude numbers, obviously. Uh, but there still seems to be four or five orders of magnitude gap in energy efficiency for that inference operation. And uh, that brings me to the main uh, point, our kind of main idea of my talk. So uh, we know that, uh, you know, uh, it is kind of very uh, unnatural to perform computation, which brain does, which is highly, you know, very noisy in a digital domain. Let's do it in analog domain. Uh, 
Um, and that's basically how we can do it. So again, this on the left-hand side, you see the most common, most important operation. And on the right-hand side, you see a circuit. Uh, so essentially, if we encode Ys and voltages, if we uh, assume Ws are represented with conductance as Gs, and uh, we're going to pin the voltage on columns and just look at the currents, currents which flows into the columns would be uh, you know, fundamentally due to Ohm's and Kirchhoff's law, uh, that sum, which is exactly dot product we want. So this is, this is a very old concept. So it was popularized by Carver, Carver Mead, the professor from Caltech. Uh, actually, it was invented even before him. Uh, now, uh, you can see that if I can make the, this, uh, you know, if I can make the structure very dense, it can be very, very uh, energy efficiency and fast just because of density. I don't have to move weights in and out like I do in digital domain. So it's kind of in-memory computing. Uh, so it's a beautiful concept uh, where I can, how I can Im implement my vector, uh, you know, dot product computation of vector by matrix multiplication if I do multiple dot products in parallel uh, very efficiently. However, there was a problem. There were no, uh, for a long time, there were no efficient adjustable conductance cross point devices. And that brings us to kind of a different revolution, which was happening recently, which, is, which was happening, you know, for, for the, in the past decade or so. So uh, just to summarize, what we're looking for is a non-volatile device, uh, which has analog properties. I can fine tune the conductance and uh, um, so which have to be very dense, right? And uh, so these are the can candidates. So they ordered in this table by, by, by maturity. On the left-hand side, you probably have the least mature. On the right-hand side, the most mature. Uh, however, the least, ma least mature rear arm or memristors are also probably the most promising just because of the density prospects. You can squeeze them as, as uh, the, you know, they would have the best density in the future, you, you would think. Okay, so, and that brings me to the second part of my talk. So I'm gonna talk, so in my lab, sorry, I, I work in actually on both ends of the spectrum, and that, that's what I'm gonna uh, talk next. Uh, first about work on rear arm, and second work about uh, uh, 2D NOR, which is uh, just a, a, a one type of flash memory. All right, so let me first start with memristors. Uh, so uh, this is probably the only slide I have on the mechanism, well, on, on, the, on the operation of memory store. So in the simplest case, this is just a two-terminal device with an insulating material sandwiched between two metal electrodes. So this black, black, black circles. Uh, typically, uh, the original state is a highly insulating state, it's called version state. Then I would have to apply large stress, electrical stress, voltage, or current, to uh, before I can, uh, before I can, uh, you know, to make an operational device. So if I apply this large stress, I create a filament of oxygen vacancies, and then oxygen vacancies are actually uh, you can think of, about them as a charge dopants, uh, which would move inside when you when there is an electric field, or they can also diffuse. So uh, when I create this filament, if I, when I s apply uh, electric field or voltage across the terminals, I can go from highly conductive to low conductive state reversibly. And uh, you know, I can also kind of go between two extreme states uh, continuously. So there, there, there are multi-state multi properties, so kind of analog continuous uh, switching. Um, well, okay, so this, I'll talk a little bit more probably about the, about the uh, operation of this device. Um, yeah, what's also important is that in this device we have, uh, you know, uh, a good device, properly engineered device, will have highly nonlinear switching kinetics, meaning that oxygen ions, when you apply low stress, low voltage, uh, uh, they will be frozen, so their mobility will be very, very low. However, this mobility can be modulated by as much as, as many as 10 orders of magnitude when I 
apply just double the voltage. And that has to do with the fact that mobility is exponentially dependent on the electric field and also on the temperature. So you have super exponential dependence. And by the way, for that reason, you really need to have uh, uh, very low, very thin films. So that's why even though it's an old device, it, you know, uh, we, were, we learned how to build them properly only recently. OK, so now I have three kind of aspects of memristors after working with them with, for you know, 10, 15 years. So let's first start with the good part. So the good news is that it's an ionic memory mechanism. Ions don't tunnel very, very easily as opposed to electrons. I can squeeze ions into five by, you know, five nanometer cube, and uh, I can still have plenty of them there that it's a, it, uh, the, the, there will be good analog properties. And that was demonstrated. So this is work from my group where we have about 50 nanometer active area. And here is, for example, for that device, there is a chart showing that we can tune the, the current through the device to any state in, 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 the, in a desired state within certain dynamic range. Uh, so now it's ionic memory mechanism. As I mentioned, I can uh, engineer it properly. If I engineer it properly, I can combine, uh, you know, I, I can have a very fast switching, sub nanosecond switching, and it can be combined with year scale retention. Um, and uh, just to maybe expand more on that, so how it happens. So uh, ions move in solids by hoping. So, and you can imagine, uh, you know, if I don't have any stress, it, and if in properly engineered uh, material, it, the ion would sit behind very uh, large energy barrier, maybe one EV. So, and it will, it will attempt to escape, but the chances would be very low. And I can lower that energy by much if I heat it up. So effectively, I'll move it that position higher up. So uh, effectively, the barrier will be lower. Or if I apply uh, a strong field, I can tilt that kind of energy uh, uh, diagram and also have a lower effective uh, barrier for ions to move. And that's how I get super exponential, you know, no, highly nonlinear switching kinetic. And this is experimental data showing you essentially it's a, for the device when the, I'm applying a pulse of variable uh, duration, see there is a plateau where nothing is happening for small voltage pulses, but then there are rapid changes once I go outside of that period. Okay, so now let's go to the bad part. So uh, our champion devices, which I'll talk later, are amorphous, based on amorphous materials and uh, or you know nanocrystalline. For that reason, uh, for example, as opposed to MOSFETs, where you really rely on high-quality substrate. For that reason, you do expect much larger amount of variations. The most important are device to device. This is what kind of killing, or you know, what is the most important for now for, for, for all of the application of memristors. Uh, in particular, variation, which I'll return more, variation and switching threshold. If I want to register for the device the threshold at which the, cu the current would jump when I apply a ramp, you know, uh, voltage ramp. And I could record it for the, for the multiple devices and you know, I'll get some histogram. I want that histogram as tight as possible. Uh, obviously, there are other problems like uh, lower endurance, so how many times I can cycle, you know, switch it back and forth before I kill it. And that is much lower than electronic devices, higher noise, but these are actually not really a problem for us. And the ugly part is that, well, there is no really a, a infrastructure to build this memristor circuits yet. So we, uh, all that work has to be done in a lab. And that's what we're doing. And uh, uh, so I'm saying here there is hope. So actually, there, there were success stories about memristors or rear arm. So I'm kind of, it's the same thing. Uh, you may have heard about Adesto. You may have heard about the Panasonic. Uh, now, the problem is originally memristors were the hope was that they will replace the lowest level of your memory hierarchy flash, or you know, HDDs. And uh, it is easy to do because you don't need high endurance for that. You, it can be slow, etc. But three, the development in 3D NAND completely took the ground out of, of, of that. And that was the killing kind of really took all the wind from the memristors. Competing with DRAM is much more challenging because DRAM needs high endurance. You need 10 to the 11 times to cycle it, et cetera. And that's very hard to achieve on, on VLSIL scale. Now, uh, Intel recently came up with this uh, cross 
point technology where they trying to position their devices in between flash and DRAM. And you know, there are some challenges about that. You need to kind of have an infrastructure, et cetera. So it's not completely, I mean, there, there is hope, of course. I mean, the technology is actually good. You can do, you know, there are success stories. It's just what I, one point I want to kind of mention here is this we were all developed in mind for uh, memory applications, but for applications which I'm looking into, we need analog memory, we need continuously change the state, and we also don't want to have transistor coupled to a memory cell, to memory device. Just like uh, in a DRAM, for those who know, you know, every capacitor comes with a transistor. Because one T1R kind of memory memory is a, the, it's not much better than the flash, nor flash. So, uh, okay, I'll make, I'll talk more about it later. So that brings us to what I do in my, kind of to the state of the art cir uh, devices circuits which I build in my lab. Well, not myself, but uh, I never build myself anything, so, but, uh, students and postdocs, and uh, so this is a state-of-the-art crossbar, passive crossbar, and uh, so what you see here is a 20 by 20 crossbar circuit where, you know, on every intersection you have one device, so it's a top view, and this is a cross-section for a particular device. So now, uh, 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 so let me basically maybe a little brag about what's so good about the structure. So as I mentioned, the biggest problem is kind of uniformity in the device characteristics. Uh, what we notice is that the spread and the dispersion in these characteristics comes from the, from the uh, forming step. So the forming step, you, it's very hard to control it. And uh, if you have poor control, you can imagine you sometimes you have one filament, two filaments, a lot of different things may happen if you have kind of poor control during forming. So what we notice is that the forming voltage or forming power is correlated with the conductance of the film, uh, of virgin film. So, so the natural solution was to lower the conductance of, of virgin film by controlling stoichiometry of, okay, by controlling stoichiometry of titanium dioxide. So titanium dioxide here is our main material which is switching. So X is representative of kind of vacancies which are missing oxygen ions. And uh, so that was kind of challenging because uh, for titanium dioxide, you very quickly go from highly insulating, you cannot even measure, to, to uh, metallic kind of magnetic phase type of stoichiometry. So that was the main challenge, and at the end, what kind of the breakthrough was the modifying of sputtering system to have a precise control of this X during the deposition. Uh, so when we lower the forming voltage, we have much f tighter spreads. There was one problem that when the devices are very leaky, uh, that doesn't work very well for circuitry. So we had to add aluminum layer, aluminum oxide layer, to prevent leakages at small voltages, but at higher voltages, it's transparent transparent kind of uh, barrier. So that is our special special kind of structure. It's a bilayer that led to that special structure. So this is more uh, details on, on this kind of hysteresis which we had to overcome in sputtering system. And this is, for example, what you would get from our devices. You know, uh, this is measured across, you know, hundreds of the devices. So you see it's still a quite uh, long tails and they would grow with, with, with uh, you know, larger circuits. But it's one of the best in literature as far as I am concerned. Okay, so now, um, so what do we do with these crossbars? Uh, well, uh, we want to implement vector by matrix multiplication operation. So the task which we have to do is to set up the, the conductance of every cross point device. So how do we do it? We're going to apply half of the right voltage. Let's say we want to set up conductance of this device. We're going to apply half of the right voltage on this line, half, minus half, of, or you know, minus half here, plus half here, ground everything, every, all of the other lines. So full voltage is going to drop here, and as this right voltage is going to switch it. Uh, so that's what we want. So now, where, why the variations have to be very tight? So there are a lot of devices which sits on these yellow lines, which are half so-called half-selected. So they experience half of the bias. So now, if your distribution is quite wide, half of that voltage may start disturbing the other devices. 
and that's uh, that's you, uh, say in essence you won't be able just to tune uh, to tune the conductance of the device when you're going to be tuning the conductance of one device you're going to be disturbing others which are half selected so that's uh, th that's the main reason why we want to, uh, to, f to 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 lower the variations and if you don't have the low variations you won't be able to do to, to demonstrate much so this is a, a example of tuning in this crossbar so this is a smiley face so uh, the color here represents the kind of coded uh, you know to the conductance uh, we want to have on the device so this is desired this is end result when we fine-tune it all of the devices and then read the resistances or the currents back so fine-tuning by itself process consists of application of write pulse read pulse write pulse it's based on so-called the right verify algorithm it's very common in, in flash it's there is a feedback so we kind of calculate, if we far away from the, from the conductance we want, we can calculate, you know, what pulse we need to apply, pulse we need to, apply to, get, to get there. So now once every uh, conductance in that structure is tuned, I can perform my vector by matrix multiplication by just applying voltages on horizontal lines and just sensing currents from, you know, grounding them and sensing currents. This is my whole VMM. So, and that is, you know, you, you can imagine that can be very, very dense, right, uh, compared to, for example, digital circuitry. Um, okay, so let's move on. So this is one of the latest experiments done where we implemented multi-layer perceptron, uh, where we used two kind of uh, 20 by 20 crossbars, actually portions of them, uh, which would be interconnected via neurons. Uh, so this is a structure of MLP. So this uh, network has all of the key features of your larger classifier, deep learning classifier. The only, ca of course, issue is that this is uh, only 1,000 devices and uh, deep learning classifier has uh, milli uh, billions of them. So we need to scale in complexity at one point. Uh, and this is kind of more details on that demo so the crossbars were uh, packaged and put on a PCB and uh, you know integrated together with uh, discrete IC CMOS neurons sitting on another board uh, the whole network was trained ex situ so when we calculate weights in the software and then we just import them and then we test it so it's a smallish perceptron we test it on a uh, small patterns black and white patterns so we get uh, uh, reasonable performance out uh, we could train it we could classify correctly patterns uh, now uh, the go the uh, nice feature about passive crossbars passive uh, memory stiff crossbars that you can monolithically integrate ma many of them and uh, you know there's no transistor transistors uh, which would be which would be a problem for integration so then uh, the student here, well, Gina, she actually improved. So for integration, the problem typically that you, you know, you really need to improve your technology even further if you start monolithic integration because increased number of steps, uh, if you have poor yield in every of the, you know, uh, very quickly the, whole, the yield of the whole structure goes to zero. So uh, this is one of the very recent work where we improved our process further. We uh, changed the uh, patterning from liftoff to ion milling, which allowed us to make uh, uh, in situ interfaces, uh, you know, between titanium oxide, aluminum oxide, that improved even further uniformity, and allow us to build uh, 3D structures. So, where does this work should go? I mean, what are the next important steps? In order to demonstrate any energy efficiency, you have to integrate very tightly with CMO, uh, memristors with CMOS. If you don't do it, you on a PCB kind of scale integration, you will never be able to demonstrate a good energy efficiency or speed. And that's what we were doing on the background, kind of the, this work was done by Baswar Chakrabarti. So we essentially fabricated a CMOS chip uh, uh, and then uh, tried to integrate on top uh, memristors, uh, five by five chip, something like that. And he succeeded, so he was able to do dot product uh, involving devices between the layers and inter layers. The, however, there was a major challenge here. And the major challenge is, you know, the topography, the roughness of CMOS surface was very uh, uh, 
uh, very high. So you have maybe one micron peak to volley. And uh, it was really a nightmare to planarize it when the chip is so small. And the solution is actually you just have to go to wafer scale processing, which would be more expensive. But you can ask CMOS, uh, you know, fab to take it out of production line when it's perfectly flat and all of these problems go away. So this is what's happening on the background now. I mean, uh, this is our next major project, uh, which, which we're working on in my lab. So now let me uh, switch gears and uh, talk about, actually it's a third part, floating gate technology. So uh, we can also implement uh, this uh, most important operation, vector by matrix multiplication with, with floating gate devices. So these are three terminal devices. The structure will be not as dense, but the good news, it's a mature technology, right? Um, so now there are also nice features that we don't really need high gain amplifiers just because there is internal gain. In our devices, we use them in sub-threshold mode. Uh, now, the idea of using the uh, floating gate technology for synapses is also quite old. So it, Carver Mead uh, and his student kind of was following it, this idea. And they use standard CMOS process to implement this floating gate memory. And the problem when you, you know, when you don't have specialized process for that, you get pretty large area for memory cell. Maybe 1,000 F square, wherever the feature size. And uh, when you have very sparse area, your, your performance is not that great. Uh, now, and this is too bad because, you know, we know that uh, flash memories were evolving. There was a lot of investment in this technology. We, you know, uh, uh, billions of dollars investment. Uh, so why won't we use, in, you know, commercial grade memory for that same purpose? And that's exactly what we did. So the kind of why academia never kind of use it or did not use it as much because there's a huge barrier. So these companies are very protective of their IP. It's very hard for academician to work with. But we were fortunate enough. There was a big project. So we work with this uh, silicon storage technology uh, incorporation. So with that company, they have, for example, this you see two generation of cells. They're much smaller. They're also very high quality. So for one of the important things, you don't want to have any defects like shallow traps in these devices because it gives you very, very bad analog properties. And these devices are perfect. 80% of the cells, fresh cells, doesn't have any defects in the channel. They're, they're much denser. There's just one problem. So this technology was developed for digital applications in mind, digital memory, which means that uh, you can program move charge to the gate uh, individually for, for every cell, but you erase all cells at the same time. It's just how they wired. So and our first uh, task was to rewire this kind of matrix. Uh, we essentially changed the direction of gate lines so that we could both program and erase individually all the cells. And kind of the area swell a little bit of the cell, but still was much better than or you know, whatever was prior work. And here you see the tuning of the current at the specific biasing conditions in a very large dynamic range to very high precision, effectively eight bit precision per wave. So let me skip this, uh, this slide. So then we, next step was to, I mean, this is a real, this is a, a very well developed technology. It's compatible with CMOS. Essentially you just build this, you can build circuits just uh, like a regular CMOS circuit. Once, once we modify the technology. And after a couple of test circuits, we right away try to build a much larger multi-layer perceptron. So the size of the perceptron was such that it can do classification of NIST images. So there are about 100,000 uh, synapses of uh, floating uh, gate memory cells. Uh, you see the structure, so it uh, has all the circuitry, decoders, maxes for programming, etc. cetera. Uh, so now this is a layout of the chip. Um, so it, it's not sparse, obviously, as you can see from here. Uh, that was not our um, kind of goal for the first chip. Uh, the, it is built in 180 nanometer technology. Uh, the encouraging part, we were worried that, for example, high level portion of the circuitry would take a lot of space. So flash requires very high voltages, like you know, 10 plus volt 
for programming erasure. But it wasn't that bad, maybe 30%. I'm going to show you that it's actually even better for if you do a better job. And another interesting uh, fact is that the memory efficiency was pretty high, 25%. So it's amount of area occupied by memory cells, which is also very good, interesting number. So here are the main results for this work. Uh, we trained this network also ex situ. So in the software, we, def we understood what the weight should be, what currents, how, what currents should be for every cell. Then we tuned these weights. Uh, in the hardware, and then we run the uh, NIST benchmark uh, test patterns through the through the hardware and uh, measured the experimental results. So now uh, this is the uh, results for these measurements. But uh, the kind of to summarize, uh, we got 94.65 experimental fidelity, which is within two percent of theoretical the best performance you can get an ideal software kind of network without all the artifacts of hardware. Uh, that was very encouraging. The most encouraging was actually uh, measured experimentally latency per, like for inference per, per each pat per, per pattern and energy, uh, which are these figures. And if I compare it with a, with a IBM True North, and it's uh, uh, we, uh, what we get here experimentally, both latency and energy is four orders of magnitude better compared to true north at for the for the problem uh, for the MIS problem at the same classification fidelity. So comparing at the same classification fidelity is very important because you know uh, you have to make sure that uh, you know you're comparing uh, similar networks. You may have network which is hundred times larger just to have an extra 2% in, in fidelity. So that is at the same fidelity, it's important. So also our, this chip was a 180 nanometer, IBM True North is 28 nanometer. Well, maybe IBM True North is kind of a bit flexible and our chip is more like an ASIC, but you have eight orders in area delay metric, which is very encouraging. Uh, moreover, we uh, look at the, so that chip was sitting on a shelf for seven months. We then remeasure uh, we remeasure all of the weights, and we look at the, uh, for example, uh, here that figure showing you uh, the currents for every cell. So ideally, you want to be in 50, 45 degree. So the, if there are no changes, but all of the cells kind of lose a little bit of current, or you know the currents dropped for all of the cells. Uh, however. It didn't lead to any changes in the classification performance. So this is recorded again experimentally uh, differences from original uh, with respect uh, so seven months after with respect to original in the uh, voltage output on all of the uh, across all of the 10,000 images. So histogram, one panel per each output. And even though there are some noticeable differences, there are no differences in classification performance. So that was encouraging. Moreover, there were no changes in the classification performance across temperature range, kind of up to 120 degrees. So the reason, if you wonder why is that, well, we, of course, we thought about it very hard. So it's, uh, well, first of all, it's because of differential design. So, uh, you know, if, if your changes, if all of the weights go to the same direction, which happens also when you change the temperature, your weights, uh, you know, your currents is just going up, but all of them simultaneously, the network is quite robust to that. And maybe the second reason we actually modified slightly the training algorithm so that to maximize uh, output between the correct uh, class and the second highest. Where kind of this work should kind of, uh, what's the future next steps for this work? Well, we have to try a better technology node and a better kind of cell design, ASF3. So the, we already start doing that. This is the results for vector by matrix, experimental, experimental results for vector by matrix multiplier and 55 nanometers. This technology can be scaled to 28 nanometers. Uh, all of the things are same for the, as for the 180, maybe even better, except for the noise, which is which is uh, expectable. So noise is going to just go, uh, is going to be large as you as you go to deeper noise. And uh, we right now, for example, waiting for much larger network design in uh, 55 nanometers. So this is a true convolutional deep learning network, which is designed much better. 
uh, more, you know, you see that layout is a lot cleaner. And we see that, for example, high voltage part is completely shrunk to 10% and memory efficiency is about 30%. So it has a very nice, you know, you can design it very efficiently. So as a summary, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, I hope that the numbers I showed you and the numbers which we measured, they really uh, exciting and very encouraging. So we see a huge, uh, you know, factors, you, you know, we could, could have up to uh, 10,000, as I mentioned, for a particular case, both in energy and speed. We actually uh, try to, using experimental data, try to uh, estimate the energy benefits and, uh, or, you know, uh, energy improvement and latency improvement for the uh, AlexNet network as compared to the recent ones. And we see that with a lot of new tricks you can add to these networks. And, you know, the, the, our first design, especially this 180 nanometer MLP, was not optimal at all. With all these uh, new tricks, we can still have many orders of magnitude of, of performance uh, uh, benefits. And uh, two points maybe I want to mention last is that, uh, so why I'm not interested in 1T1R? Because the uh, density and all of the, according to our estimates, the density and area, uh, so area and uh, energy efficiency and the speed of 1T1R uh, implementations are comparable to floating gate, why would you even care if there is already very well developed nor, nor kind of flash technology? So uh, going forward, we really want to have passive memory store technology, which is much harder to do. And the second thing is, well, of course, some of you already, I mean, you aware that there is a huge effort to reduce precision in the, in the, uh, uh, in the synaptic weights so Intel is kind of leading an effort now. They bought, you know, they bought a FPGA company. They, they bought several neuromorphic startups. There is a lot of work coming out. I think uh, if you go from 5-bit to 2-3-bit, there's a good and bad news for, for this emerging memories. The good news is that it will lo lower a lot requirement for how, for, you know, variations. It would make a lot easier to make, to demonstrate these circuits when the, you need only 2-bit precision. It would, the bad news, it would reduce the, uh, the you know, energy gains and latency gains, but uh, they would still, according to our estimates, would be more than, you know, factor of 10, which would justify uh, working in that field. So, and that would be probably the last slide, yeah. That's a good question. So there is no problem of sneak current for the neuromorphic applications because during inference, there is no, by definition, there is no sneak current. All of them are, you know, biased. Uh, you, uh, so the problem is actually a voltage drop across the lines. And uh, that's a different problem. The sneak path problem may occur when you write them. But according to our simulations, inference, you know, so kind of it's a longer answer. You can uh, solve sneak path problem by either having a selector device, right, some kind of nonlinearity, or you can just have more resistive devices, less resistive uh, lines, or both. So that's kind of, that's, that's, the, that's the solution. And what we found is that inference uh, requirements to do inference right are so much uh, worse that when you solve inference problem, problems for these writes are all disappeared. You won't need any selectors, no, no sneak. So that's, that's the answer. Yeah. Is there a way to make your stuff, uh, So, uh, yeah, I mentioned only ex situ training, and there is a point. Uh, uh, so we also tried in situ training. We, we're trying to do online training, which is kind of slightly different flavor of in situ. In situ training, you use the hardware to train also, which have an advantage. You can reconfigure around the defects on ideologies, whatever. 
my point is that if I cannot show ex situ training, if I cannot show that this system would be, that I can beat digital for the simplest ex situ training, I don't have a hope that I will do better in, in the more complicated online or whatever. I mean, at least that's my gut feeling. Because any online training also would require very efficient VMM. That would be a very important thing. If this is, to me, it's a very simple application. It's very practical, you know. Uh, autonomous cars, you know, the, the vision for the cars or, you know, this autonomous, uh, they, I don't believe they train as they drive. I mean, I wouldn't want to be in a car which, which so they, I think it's, there are plenty of applications where I don't think it's, this is going to be very relevant. Uh, again, uh, that that is uh, already a research question. We 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 uh, yeah, we're doing some experiments with that. Uh, so you can find. Okay. So uh, again, this is a kind of very relevant to what we just. So if it's exceed the training. Uh, to tune, I don't have to have many cycles. So if it's Exito, I don't use hardware for training. I don't have to do this all back propagation to use the hardware. All in software, all in software then. And actually, it has a very nice property. So uh, yeah, so that's, and for that, you don't, you, um, our estimates, you may need 1,000. You may need, you know, at least 1,000. That's already, you may re want to retrain the network from time to time, right? Uh, now. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, that's your question, or okay, yeah. So, so, so then, uh, what from literature? What I what some there are so there are claims that ministers tend to the t more than ten to the ten cycles. It's definitely not on the Willi cell scale. It's one device found in academia settings, which magically work ten to the ten times. On a larger Willi cell scale. It's going to be comparable to flash, maybe, you know, 10,000, 100,000 times, something like that. That would be the limit, which, which is a good limit, which is a good, good, good place. Maybe it's still good for online training. Yeah. Yeah, occasionally training. Right, right. I agree. So uh, v VMM by itself is a, is a, doesn't have to be just for machine learning, right? VMM. So scientific computing, things like that. The limitation is it's going to be low precision. I don't believe it's going to be better than 8-bit, you know, higher precision than 8-bit. 8-bit is already stretching. We, we, we targeting 5-bit, probably no more than that. Uh, so wherever VMM is good, scientific computing, you know, linear algebra, whatever, that's going to be useful. Uh, Memory application, I mentioned, uh, so uh, Intel, Intel Crosspoint is a good example that they're trying to find a niche, in a re, 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 uh, kind of rethink the whole hierarchy. Uh, but that's probably the example where, another example, good example, that's what they're trying to do, yeah. Oh, uh, maybe the other point to add is that what I, I didn't show you that we found, for example, very interesting application. It's for computing. You can show, say it for computing uh, in a f a hardware security. So variations, you can actually take advantage of that. And uh, we actually got very exciting results. I mean, hopefully it will be published soon. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Oh, with whom? Shavanti, okay. All right.
most of them. I think I know who you are. Yeah. You were on the, yeah. 